I have often walked down this street before, but the pavement always stayed beneath my feet before. All at once am I several stories high, cause I'm here on the street where you live. Are there lilac trees in the heart of town? Can you hear a lark in any other part of town? Does enchantment pour out of the very door? No, it's just on the street where you live. And oh, the towering feeling, just to know somehow you are near. The overpowering feeling that any second... This is a special opportunity this, this afternoon to welcome our Grand Marshal for Sculpture in Motion, Donald Osborne. You probably know Donald as TV superstar, co-host ah. of Jay Leno's Garage, <laughs> Behind the Bowtie, Assess and Caress with Donald Osborne, Mansions and Motor Cars, great automotive historian, an author, and he's back in Palm Beach post-COVID for today's event offering an incredible talk. He had given this as the CEO of the Aldrain Automobile Museum in Newport. The sculpture garden is so incredibly magical. It's as if you're in the middle of a thousand acres somewhere. You know, you have no idea that there's an actual bustling city right outside and it's, it's such an inspiring space. And um, these monumental sculptures are also quite wonderful. And to be able to do uh, what little I can to help support this great um, institution, as well as to salute our Gold Star families, is a wonderful privilege to me. This uh, is a talk about an exhibition which we did, as Francis mentioned, at the Audrain Automobile Museum in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, to which I heartily invite you all when you are up in uh, Rhode Island. And it was a an exhibition we did in, collab in collaboration with the uh, Newport Historical Society. And it was one of those things that uh, I've been having a lot of chats recently about sort of serendipity and the fact that I really don't believe that things just sort of happen. There's a reason that everything happens. And we were looking for ways to collaborate with other arts organizations in uh, Newport and we were chatting about what we might do together with the Historical Society when it happened that they were given a very gracious and amazing long-term loan of the clothes of three Vanderbilt women dating from 1880 to 1945. And we thought, ah, wouldn't it be really interesting to talk about the interplay between fashion and the automobile and specifically how the automobile really helped to liberate women and how women and fashion influenced the automobile in a very short time period at the beginning of the 20th century. And it became obvious that it was something we had to do because one of the things about Newport that I love so much is the fact that Newport lives its history. It's a place where a, a, a city that was founded in 1639 but everybody lives every day in 17th century Newport, 18th century Newport, 19th century Newport in a way that makes it much 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 more than an historical place. It's, it's a home that lives its history and one of the things that uh, quickly became apparent is the fact that the Audrain Automobile Museum is housed in the magnificent 1903 Italian Renaissance commercial palazzo on Bellevue Avenue where many of the great Gilded Age cottages happen to be located and it was built by Adolphe Audrain, a merchant uh, born of French parents in California uh, who had a, uh, he lived in New York and had a summer place in Newport and he thought he'd build as a uh, speculative development a commercial building with offices above. And so he commissioned Bruce Price to build this building, the, the Audrain building. And among its first tenants was a dressmaker, a woman named Molly O'Hara, who had a shop in New York and had a summer shop in Newport in the Audrain building. Molly O'Hara was one of the leading dressmakers to the Vanderbilt women. This exhibition actually brought back to the Audrain building the very clothes that had been first delivered to these Vanderbilt women 
in Newport. So that was very exciting. Again, another great example of, of, of the incredible exciting feeling of bringing history back together and back to life. And I've had lots of conversations uh, over the years with uh, friends and colleagues about the influence of the automobile on life in, around the world, but especially in America. Um, my good friend Miles Collier, um, who is the founder and uh, director of the um, Collier Collection and Revs Institute over in Naples, Florida, and a wonderful uh, intellectual and historian and enthusiast, um, opines that the automobile is arguably the greatest technological revolution in the 20th century. And the way it transforms society is nowhere better felt than in the effect that it had on women. When you think about this fact, almost nothing that a woman wore in the 1880s could be worn to even sit in a car by 1900. So women's clothing completely transformed itself because of the coming of the automobile, and not only women as passengers in the automobile, but women as active automobilists. And so this exhibition sought to combine these wonderful clothes, mostly from this collection of Vanderbilt women's clothing, with some of the cars in the Audrain collections to show in a very vibrant and, and, and practical way the effect that cars had on women's clothing and then the effect that fashion had on cars. Now, the clothes in this exhibition uh, were the clothes of three women, Alice Gwynne Vanderbilt, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, and Gladys Moore Vanderbilt Shishenyi. Now, what's really interesting about this is the fact that when you see the progression of the clothes and the cars, you also get to see a lot of how the Vanderbilt women and their family changed over these decades as well. And it's very also illustrative of the way society changed at the same time. And I apologize for the fact that you unfortunately cannot walk with me through the galleries as the uh, exhibition was laid out. But um, we have these uh, posters up just to give you a little hint of what the exhibition was like and to give you sort of highlights of uh, what we were trying to portray. This board here on my left, it's a picture of a very lovely white 1904 simplex Mercedes, double chain drive, uh, 40 horsepower car, a very fast, powerful, extremely expensive uh, car of the period. And in front of it is a figure, a mannequin, wearing a wonderful linen duster, a hat with a wonderful veil and goggles. Now, you think, okay, that's sort of a nice portrait of a nice early car with an early automobiling costume. What's extraordinary about that car is the fact that that was a car that was driven in 1905 by Alice Vanderbilt. And what's wonderful about it is the fact that this is a quote that was from the New York World on August 21st, 1905. Newport, Rhode Island. Miss Gladys Vanderbilt surprised her friends Wednesday by operating her own machine, a Mercedes. In spite of the crowded sections of Bellevue Avenue and the muddy streets, she seemed unconcerned as she passed the casino. As there are only one or two women here who run high-powered machines, Miss Vanderbilt attracted much attention. Her mother in the rear of the auto, perfectly confident in her daughter's ability. That her mother was in the back seat clearly showed that this was not some wild society girl. She did this, by the way, on the, point, on, on the occasion of her debut in society. So think, in 1905, here is the, the heiress to one of the great fortunes in America driving her own car. No man was in the car. Her and her mother <laughs> driving down Bellevue Avenue in Newport saying, this is what modern women do. We drive ourselves in powerful cars down Bellevue Avenue to see friends and wave at people. That alone was a statement that could not have been dreamed of 20 years before when many women of that station, station wouldn't have even been allowed out in a carriage by themselves. So it just was one small example of how the automobile had already changed the lives of, admittedly, the very upper class women who had access to cars. But even taking a step further, the earliest car in the exhibition was a 1902 Packard Model F. Beautiful car, wonderful two-cylinder Packard with these wonderful seats, very much like the ones you expect to see in cars of the period, sort of very tight wraparound bucket seats. 
you look at that car, you realize that to climb up into that car on a little foot stand to get into one of those seats, you could not wear a big bustle back skirt. So already clothes had to become more easier, had to become more comfortable, had to become more accommodating in order to be used by the automobilists of the period. And this is also a very interesting point as well because also in the exhibition, nearby the 1902 Packard and next to this uh, 1904 Mercedes Simplex was a 1908 Packard Model 30, a powerful short wheelbase sports car named the Gentleman's Roadster. So things hadn't actually changed that much, but nonetheless, they were slowly changing. And one of the things that uh, brought a lot of women behind the wheel for the first time was the electric automobile. Now, a lot of people think today, well, electric cars are something new. Ha, ha, ha. All of you, I'm sure, here who are automobile enthusiasts know that electric cars are nothing new at all. Uh, in fact, in another shameless plug for the Audrain Automobile Museum, uh, later next year we will be having an exhibition entitled 125 Years of Electric Cars. You must come to Newport and see it. And here behind me on this side is a car which has also an interesting sort of vaguely Palm Beach connection. You'll see why it's a 1911 Roush and Lang electric roadster. This particular car, which is almost completely original, was delivered when new to Briggs Cunningham's mother, Elizabeth. And of course, Briggs Cunningham has great uh, West Palm Beach history. Um, but also, one of the things that you see in looking at the picture of the Mercedes simplex and the duster and the veil and the goggles, we have paired the Roush and Lang electric roadster with a cut velvet evening coat. Now that is something that you could never have dreamed of wearing in a, an internal combustion gasoline car with the explosions and the oil and all of this. All of a sudden, a woman could drive a vehicle that was not noisy or dirty, didn't have to be cranked. So all of a sudden, you were able to take your trips out by yourself. You didn't have to bother the chauffeur to start your car. You could just walk out your front door, walk to your electric car, hit the switch, turn the tiller, and off you went. And this was a great revolution as well. Uh, it became the first real popular city car, and so it was very, very popular and, and quite common to see hordes of electric cars going back and forth in towns like Newport, where people would, play, would pay their afternoon calls, uh, now instead of being driven by their coachmen, on their own in their electric carriages. And also, it also reinforces something which is almost completely forgotten today. Even the electric, even, sorry, the internal combustion gasoline vehicle was viewed as an ecological savior. Think about that. Horses were the primary form of transportation for, for work, for, for everything that had to be done, deliveries. Cities were filthy places. And the automobile was hailed at the turn of the century as a, as a device which would deliver health and cleanliness to the human population and deliver us from the scourge of the horse. Now, of course, it's sort of interesting and ironic to, to hear those words today when the, uh, the automobile today in many quarters is held as the horse of the uh, 21st century. But nonetheless, it is something that needs to be recalled that every improvement comes with some sort of a price. One of the things, as a matter of fact, that they thought the automobile would do would also cut traffic congestion. Well, you think about it. For the length of every carriage, you had the equal length of horses. So they said, well, if you take the horses out of the equation, you have twice as much street left. They didn't realize, of course, that cars would quickly come and fill that space up. But nonetheless, there you are. And the next uh, point we get to is, and this is a really exciting point, I'm, I'm jumping here by decades, but uh, you'll get my point. This lovely black dress here has behind it a poster. And again, for those sitting on the side, it's a absolutely beautifully cut black silk evening dress, very, very simply uh, designed, uh, adorned with some diamond clasps um, at, the, at the bosom, at the neckline, and it falls draping quite elegantly and behind it is a black and white drawing of a woman. 
And now, by the late 1920s, we've entered a time when the automobile is no longer just the plaything for a very small, rich set of automobilists. By 1908, of course, the Model T had been uh, introduced. And by 1920, the Model T was ubiquitous. Every middle class person could not only aspire to own a car, but probably did. And many, many, many women were driving their own cars and making the buying decisions on cars. All of a sudden, it wasn't enough just to have something that was practical and durable. A car had to be sold with something else, and that something else was fashion. The art and color section was founded by Harley Earl in 1927 at General Motors, and all of a sudden you needed style to sell a car. Just saying, well, I've got more horsepower than the other guy's car and my tires last longer wasn't enough. And we've even gotten to the point where what I think is probably one of the most revolutionary, truly revolutionary, advertising approaches and campaigns ever seen in cars appears. That black and white drawing, which just shows this incredibly elegantly dressed women, woman, one of a series, standing in usually an evening setting with not a car in sight and one simple tagline at the bottom, she drives a Duesenberg. <laughs> not she is driven in a Duesenberg, she owns a Duesenberg, she drives a Duesenberg. It tells you everything about what the style of this car is. This is what you aspire to. If you're a gentleman who wants a big, powerful car, you want to buy one because, hey, you might get this woman to actually ride with you or drive you somewhere in it. So it, it's something that, that is really, really special. In the exhibition, we had it paired with a car in the Audrain collection, which is one of my favorites, a 1930 Duesenberg Model J town sedan by Murphy of Pasadena. Originally built for Nanoline Holt Inman Duke, Doris Duke's mother, a woman who was uh, known to have great style and great presence. And the fact that it's a town car, a town car is, is generally a, a fairly upright, formal, kind of squarish thing. But Murphy has taken this style and in their California uh, design aesthetic, with a lowered roof, the very thin pillars for which Murphy was known, turned it into a thing of great style and dash. And that is an example of how fashion really came to influence the, uh, the look of cars and the way people chose their cars. And continuing in that theme, probably the ultimate expression of that in the 1930s is the Auburn Speedster. This is a car, Auburns were good cars. And they're certainly acceptable cars and, and had very good performance, certainly, especially the Speedsters. But the speed, Auburn Speedster was built for style and style alone. And um, the Speedster is, is paired with this incredible garment, which, it, and those of you, again, sitting on the side, please, after I finish, come over and take a look at these boards, because I think they're, they're worth taking a glance at. The Auburn Speedster is paired with this incredible Japanese coat style, which is a coat from Bonwit Teller in New York, built for um, um, uh, Gertrude Whitney. And it's this incredibly shiny, um, Jap Japanese-looking uh, floral uh, leaf print and it's also incredibly diaphanous, which you can't really get from the photograph, but you can just imagine the effect of this garment when someone's wearing this, driving this car, seeing it move on the air. And it just really sort of reinforced the entire idea of the aerodynamics and the style of an Auburn Speedster. And also reflects something very, very interesting because we are at the moment when we're moving from display of the driver in the car to something slightly more conservative and slightly more concealed. The first cars, remember, obviously, people sat very upright, much as they did in carriages. Big display of the big hat, the veils, the entire thing. By the time the 30s move on, all of a sudden, we're beginning to see cars with sort of blind rear quarters. As the Depression certainly um, goes on, people don't necessarily want to be flaunted in the back of their cars. They'll reveal the clothes they're wearing once they step out of the cars, but riding in the cars, they, they want a slightly quieter look. And the last image here on, the, uh, on, on my right is a suit by Hattie Carnegie, designed very much and inspired by the new look of Dior. It's a uh, suit from 1945, and it's paired with a 1941 Cadillac Fleetwood limousine, which was delivered new to the, uh, the uh, Vanderbilt garage 
uh, right before World War II. And the woman for whom it was made is actually can be seen in the picture above the rear window at her wedding, that is Countess Zapari at her wedding, uh, driving away from the wedding in that very car. And it shows that at this point, just as in automotive design, it was all about form, form and detail. It wasn't about flash and surface decoration. All of a sudden now it was about the tailoring, even in cars. And until the late 50s, which we don't get into in this, when cars sort of went crazy with fins and chrome and all that, even that was reflected in a reflection of fashion at the time as well, but that's another discussion for another time. But the fact that we've gone from the era of the totally functional through the decorative and back to the functional. Women's fashion being created by the needs of the automobile to the automobile being inspired by women's fashion. Thank you very much. That any second you may suddenly appear. People stop and stare, they don't bother me. Cause there's nowhere else on earth that I would rather be. Let the time go by, I won't care if I can be 